<laughs> All right, and we are here on day one of of full full release. Full release is finally here. And just to kick things off, I am going to be showing everyone a new mega character creation video. This is going to be relatively uncut for those of you still downloading, still waiting. I am going to rush to try to get this out as quickly as I can for all of y'all to get your teeth into because this game, it's been, it's been a very long wait. Uh, Okay, um, a lot has changed. As you can see, a lot has changed. So of course we have our origin character that we can start off with customizations as we're used to. But don't forget, we are allowed to play as our actual companions, the original origin characters. We got good old Astarian, he looks as sexy as ever. We got Lyzel, I still love her armor. And her hairdo, I really do like that. I think it's one of my favorites of the game. Gale. I still have mixed feelings about him. I really do. He, there was a time, there was a time where he actually was hotter. <laughs> um, but that's a discussion that has already been had. Shadowhar looking as good as ever. We have Will. All right, Will, I heard that they actually changed his whole background, his whole story. So I don't know what that, what that's about. But, um, yeah, it's just a little thing that got mentioned here and there somewhere before uh, in the last updates. And then Carlac, she has been added as the next new origin companion that we can play as and, of course, go recruit. Um, and, of course, we had the Dark Urge talk to us. This is the only origin of the origin characters um, that you can actually customize uh, their race and their class. All of that, you can change it to look however you want. And I just realized these all have descriptions. After 200 years serving a cruel master, the vampire spawn Astarian is finally free. Free to walk in the sun, free to chase power, and free to take revenge. Is it an introduction? Oh. Oh. Hello, darling. Oh. Don't be shy. I promise not to bite until we've been formally introduced. My name's Astarian, and I've spent a century stalking the night, hunting for pretty morsels just like you. A man called Cazador made me what I am, kept me like a pet, forced me to do his bidding. No more. The Tapel's influence broke his dominance over me, and now I can finally pursue the one thing I've hungered for these long, dark years. Revenge. I'm going back to Bloodstained to track Cazador down in his lair. I'll be the last thing the bastard ever sees. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm afraid to love this man. I really am, but I can't deny I, I love his voice. He really is amazing as a, as a character. Lysel was raised ready for a life amongst the stars, mercilessly conquering the cosmos as a Geth Yankee soldier. Grounded, she must deal with the so with a world she doesn't under understand and find a way to serve her people in a plane that despises her militant skin. And of course, quick context for those of you who don't really know about the Gith Yankee and subsequently the Githers Eye. TLDR. They used to be a slave race underneath the Lithids back when they were conquering the galaxy. And now, yada, 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 fast forward a couple, what, hundred thousand years. I forgot the timeline specifically. They are now their own self-reliant conquering species who lives amongst the stars and all that jazz and they typically don't like to be um, earthbound on certain planes of existence because of the differences between the astral sea and most mortal realms but that's a lore dive for y'all to do on a different day
Since I was born in the cold reaches of world space, I have known but one purpose. To wield a silver sword and ride a red dragon in service of my regent, the Githyanki Queen Vlakith. My first step on this path is to slay a Mind Flayer and bring its head to my queen. There is no flesh I will not carve, and no barrier I will not shatter to see it done. I am the one who sunders. I am the Undying Queen's most unshakable warrior. I am Lazelle of Kalir. And yes, as we learned in EA, she is off on basically her right to adulthood. She needs to go and kill an illithid for the first time on her own. Gail, deep down, I do still love you because I too have a thing for Mistra. Gail's wizarding prowess once earned him the love of Mistra, the goddess of magic, until his ambition led him to the brink of catastrophe. I still think this man is Carthus. Carsis. Not the bone dude from League. Um, <laughs> ancient Archmage from the time of Netheril. Homeboy who... <laughs> you know the saying, all it takes is one person to ruin a good thing? It's like, well, the goddess of magic had to create rules out of necessity because of this man, Carsis. And I still believe, I still believe Gale's backstory that he is Carsis. I have an old theory video about that if you want to dig into it. But for now, let's just <laughs> let's see what this has for us. Well met, stranger. You find yourself in the presence of the renowned wizarding prodigy, Gale of Waterdeep. Please, no need to be intimidated. My virtuosic talents once caught the eye of the goddess of magic herself, Mistra, who named me her chosen and her lover. Thanks to a slight miscalculation on my part, that relationship eventually soured, as did the greatest of my powers. Now I'm merely a humble wizard on the road to redemption. Unless I can find the path to something greater. Of course, it is also possible he wasn't Carsis and is instead a new retconned chosen of Mistra, who, of course, fucked up and was dropped by her. Is also. I'm going to assume it's kind of canon, at least from what I can see from the Elminster books. Mistra really is polyamorous, or she is poly. She she loves all of her chosen and, of course, gets romantically involved with practically all, practically all of them. But that could also just be the writing of Ed Greenwood. Shadowheart willingly undertook a ritual to remove her memories in order to protect the secrets of her fellow Shar worshippers. Loss and pain are sacred to her, but her faith is now being tested like never before. My name is Shadowheart, loyal servant of Shah, goddess of darkness and loss. There is little more I can tell you than that. My Lady Shah tasked me with a mission of such secrecy that I surrendered great swathes of my memory in order to safeguard the knowledge of it. All I know is that I must bring the artifact I hold to Baldur's Gate, and that nothing can stand in my way. My goddess is watching. And with the way things are going, you're going to lose that artifact really quickly. All right, Will. Known as the Blade of Frontiers, Will uses his magic to fell the monsters and devils menacing the Sword Coast. In a moment of desperation, he accepted an offer of great power, forcing him into an infernal game he is struggling to play. That would be the... Lore makes this tricky because of what she is. She is either a devil or a demon because... Succubus technically can be either in this universe. There is a difference between demons and doubles. A pretty significant difference. The Blood War, all that jazz. 
but succubus they kind of straddle between both it's that 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 bit of that bit of lore is a bit murky but anyways let's let's continue Seven years ago, I was exiled from Baldur's Gate, oh. the city I call home. My name is Will, but the people of the Sword Coast call me the Blade of Frontiers, champion of the meek, defender of the innocent. The truth isn't quite so simple, but they're right about one thing. I hunt monsters, and I always catch my prey. My latest target is a devil, and I'm right on her tail. Once I'm through with her, she'll never escape the fires of the first hell. So that's interesting. Is this supposed to be... Are they actually retconning his original story with his contract with Mizora? Or is he just kind of lying to us in the introduction? Like, yes, he is hunting her, but not to kill her. Like... Because he wants to be free of this contract. I mean, we learned that in early access as his backstory. But I also got to admit, God, I love this music. <laughs> I also have to admit, he's actually my least favorite out of all the Origin Companions. I'm, I'm, I honestly, I was tied between Shadowheart and Lysel. But Gale, he, he holds the special place off and off on the side. <laughs> Karlak, though, I have I have a good feeling about her because we got to see a bit of her during the panel from hell, and I, I do have a good feeling about her. Karlak has escaped 10 years of service in the hells with nothing but the axe on her back and the infernal engine blazing furiously where her heart used to be. And it was already, I guess, teased in one of the updates that, of course, Zariel canonically has survived and is still doing her stuff down down south in, in hell. Um... See, so yeah, the Alteral Cannon has been solidified, and of course, she put some shit inside of her so that she could just be a stronger um, barbarian. Ten years ago, I was sold to the Archdevil Zariel. She put a hellfire engine in my chest and made me her prized soldier. But I've escaped now. <laughs> Thank you, Mind Flayers. And I've got a few scores to settle. If this engine doesn't burn me to ash first, I'll need people I can trust. An infernal mechanic and a serious amount of luck. But you know what? I'm not worried. After 10 years in the hells, I can take on anything. I've got my chance at freedom, and believe me, I'm going home. Okay, maybe maybe it's the leather. She's actually kind of hot. <laughs> I, I haven't had a chance to get a good look at her until now, and I'm a bit surprised. All right, the dark urge. You remember nothing but a path paved with blood, unimaginable cruelty whispers to you from within. Can you escape it? Would you even want to? And of course, your appearance and class can be fully customized. My rancid blood whispers to me. That's your voice. Kill and kill again. <clears throat> My ruined body yearns to reap death in this world. And when this foul urge calls, it possesses my whole being. Injured beyond repair. I know nothing besides this. I must resist the dark urge, lest it consume my mind. I must discover who I was and what happened to me before my twitching knife hand writes a tragedy in blood.
quick theory, although I believe it's nonsense. I did see uh, one or two people talk about how the Dark Urge might be a bull spawn. And no, that, that whole thing's done. They're all dead. Abdel was the last one. And that circle beneath him, though, you know, those runes around the outside, that's most likely gibberish. I'm sure it's probably decipherable if you want to dig hard enough. I'm not going to. But those little drops, those dots that were inside of the runes on the like the very inner circle, that is the symbol for ball. I mean, yes, there is usually a skull in the middle of the circle of blood. If you go and look at the old games or just look up his general symbol, like, yes, that is him. Um... And as we know, canonically from Murder and Baldur's Gate, Ball, he is now a weak little nameless wisp that can subtly influence evil people. This could be his work. It could be that between people like him and then Orin the Red, because we already know she is a murderous maniac, um, who I'm fairly certain is in the same or similar situation. It could be that they're just being plagued by Ball, just talking to them. The dark urge is literally Ball whispering to him, hey, murder, 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 murder. I need you to murder for me. So yeah, that's my best guess for the moment, considering how new this is and just how unknown they really are. But um, anyways, let's move on. That is all of the origin characters. Actually, one curiosity real quick. Go to Dark Urge, Edit Appearance. No, no, hold on. Dark Urge, Race. As a curiosity. Change the race of the Dark Urge. Let's get you female. Let's go back and then play the introduction. Let's see if that'll actually update this. Ah, no, it's stuck. Okay. I. <laughs> I ruined it. I must. Uh, it would have been really cool if it actually honored what you looked like to go and play the introduction. But I mean, it, it's an introduction. We're going to see it once and then forget about it. It would have been cool if it did change, though. OK, a custom. <laughs> OK, so uh, one thing I tried to bring up, I think some people may have missed because, you know, all this news this past week has been super quick. We have body types. So instead of uh, gender being a selection like how uh, kind of it used to be, we now just have body types. We have our basic female, basic male, and then we have buff female and buff male. Because the day Daddy Halson made his appearance, literally half the internet was just thirsting for this man and his beautiful biceps. But anyways, um, <laughs> I think something really cool they also added is there's an appearance randomizer. Oh, <laughs> that is very random. Um, this is good, though, because you can have a lot of fun with this, or you can just roll the dice and just jump right in. Um, uh, wow. OK, so here we have another randomized button, and I think that's a total randomization. So that's yep, that is race, that is class, that is gender. That is quite literally a true randomized button. Um, and also just to before diving into actual full custom mode, looking at our actual origin companions, uh, yes, the dark urge, we can change our race and we can change our class. However, <clears throat> supposedly the respecting system for origin characters, if you play as one, you can respect your class. But as you're creating it right now, of course, you are locked to your race. That is an integral part of their identity. You are locked into their sub race, their identity, their class. Now, as they mentioned, this too is an integral part of their identity and we cannot change it here. However, they did mention kind of snuck it in. It may not lead to anything, but to my understanding, if you find the respecting person in act one, you can change the class of an origin character, supposedly. I don't know how true that is. And supposedly, if you do that, um, it'll lead to different dialogue types of options because this is supposed to be part of our identity. But we'll see as time goes on. Personally, I don't want to play as the origin characters. I want to be my own person and I want them all to just be with me. I, I want to collect everyone and have friends with everyone. Because so, 
Without further ado, let's explore character creation. 23 minutes and we're just now at character creation. My God. Okay, let's 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 jump in. Um, let's look at. I guess we'll look at guys first. Actually, no. Let's, let's look. Let's look at classes first. I feel like people are gonna be more eager for that than anything else. Okay, all of the classes at full release. I'm certain that modding community will probably create more as time goes on. Let them do their thing while we do our thing. We got Barbarian, Bard, Cleric, Druid, Fighter, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, Rogue, Sorcerer, Warlock, and Wizard. And just remember, not all of these will let you choose your subclass at the start. Some of them will give you subclass options like level two or three. And of course, we explored a lot of those subclasses. And many other channels explore those subclasses in older videos. So you can go digging for that if you want. However, I will honestly still, I still suggest if you want a quick glance just go download the DD 5e manual and then you can glance there because a lot of that will be pretty close to what we're gonna get but i digress let's look at what we have Barbar details button okay so of course i'm not going to explain proficiencies um we have our options here is that listed anywhere else okay down here we have proficiencies to list it out so Starting off with character creation, barbarians, we are going to, and I think that cantrip is stuck because of being an elf. <clears throat> Starting action, we got our rage. We have our class feature for unarmored defense. Okay, I don't remember this one. While not wearing armor, you add your con modifier to your AC and heavy armor impedes your rage. That, okay. So you gotta be, <laughs> you gotta free the nipple if you wanna have that bonus. And for the moment, Okay, so let's look up Bard. Of course, our spell classes will have more to offer us. Bard, you know, music. Oh, let me read these. Barbarian, the strong embrace the wild that hides inside. Key instincts, primal physicality, and most of all, an unbridled, unquenchable rage. Okay, Bard, you know the music? You know music is more than a fancy, it is a power. Through study and adventure, you have mastered song, speech, and the magic within. I... I really hope that somebody um, can make a mod for um, that guy from Stranger Things. Gosh, it's been too long. But just that, that scene of him just rocking out on top of the car in the season finale, that is just immortalized as a bard moment. The hordes are coming and you alone bard are gonna do your thing to let your friends escape. Inspirational. Anyways. We're going to start off with the cantrips of oh, Vicious Mockery. This will be the bread and butter for most of you for damage. And then we got Blade Ward. That's pretty standard. A lot of other classes and races will give you the option to have this. I personally don't like using it unless I am in a long fight with literally nothing else to use. We have our spell selections to start off with. Healing, Distant Whispers, Tasha's Heady's Laughter, and then Heroism. Our basic actions, Bardic Inspiration. This will also be bread and butter as a paladin because it is unique to your class. Inspire an ally to add a 1d6 bonus to their next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. And it'll last until long rest. And it looks like this one isn't a concentration, thankfully. Because I know some of those can be kind of annoying if you get hit. It's over. And of course, it takes Bardic Inspiration points, which is a point system unique to the Bard class. And then class feature spells. And also just, I guess, yes, I'm not going to explain it, but I will say um, if you have. So I will explain if you have um, references with your weapons that you like using for as generally speaking, if you have weapons that you like using more than others, um, keep an eye on the proficiencies because these are going to have an effect on what you use, like just a quick example, add your proficiency bonus to attack rolls with long sword. So you will have bonuses. So make sure to adhere to these so that you can have, you know, help where it's where it's available, because otherwise things could be a little harder unintentionally. Starting off with clerics now, we have cantrips. Of course, basics of the clerics, resistance, we have guidance, we have sacred flame. Now, as much as I hated how much bad luck um, Shadowheart has, at least in early access, she had abysmal luck with getting her stuff done. 
These three are actually really, really useful. And I do advise that if you're not going to play a cleric of some sort to make sure you have Shadow Heart ready for, at the very least, guidance and resistance, because I think they're actually very useful. Of course, you have your basic spell selections. We got Guiding Bolt to start off with Healing Ward. Inflict Wounds is actually really, really good. I, this is a favorite of mine. Shield of Faith and then Bane. Of course, spell slots class feature, but we have domain spells, meaning, of course, as a cleric, you choose your domains and you get to have extra goodies associated with them. Druids, Druids channel the elemental forces of nature and share a deep kinship with animals, much like me. Master of Wild Shape allows them to transform into beasts from all over the realms. You've got your Shillelagh, which is actually going to be really, really useful for quite a while until you get like a super awesome weapon. And then Thorn Whip, not reliable damage, but it's fun to use, especially because you can yank people a little bit closer to you. Spells. Ooh, that's a new one. Ice Knife. That's a lot of damage. Throw a shard of ice that deals 20 to piercing damage. It explodes and deals code damage to anyone nearby. It leaves an ice surface too. Oop, I forgot the button. Uh, T, inspect. The spell can be cast while you are silenced. That's actually really good. Um, on miss, the shards of ice still explodes. That's good, uses the deck save. That's gonna be useful. That's going to be, oh, I almost wish this was a cantrip, but it's, it's too good to be a cantrip. Thunder wave. I would also argue this is old reliable because if, if doo doo is hitting the fan and you're surrounded, just vroom, knock everyone away. Then we have cure wounds. Of course, you always need to have healing, healing word. Of course, one of these is for close where you got to touch them to heal them. And another one you can do from range and then enhanced leap. Yep. House and body type. Got them good forearms and biceps. Thick is the name. OK. Fighter. Let me let me let me just let's, let's sit over here on you for a bit. Yeah, strong girl. Mm. She actually looks really good with this body type. Fighter, pretty self-explanatory. Fighters have mastered the art of combat, wielding weapons and unmatched skill and wearing with unmatched skill and wearing armor like a second skin. And of course, you are going to have a second wind. You're you're going to get a lot of use out of this as a warrior. I know having Liza on the front line during early access, she relied on this quite a bit. Monks. Channel your cosmic enlightenment by deftly dodging and efficiently disassembling your foes through stunning strikes on a whirlwind of martial attacks. You start off with Fury of Blows as our basic weapon action, I guess. So, of course, just a whole lot of bludgeoning damage. Punch twice in quick succession. And then class features, we have Key. Now, much like the Bardic Inspirations, Key will be a point class, a point system unique to this class. Key is the magic that flows through all living beings. You can use it to exceed your body's physical capabilities. Or if you're a big DBZ fan, same thing. That's how they explain it. It's Key. It, it, is, it is a source of energy. Unarmored defense. Of course, we saw that before. It's a bit of the, it's a bit of the same thing, but a little different because it's monks. While your reflexes are as effective as any armor, you're one out wearing armor. You add your wisdom modifier to your armor class. If you want to optimize monks, it's going to be a little tricky balancing your stats. So I'll definitely try to put a little thought behind it. Martial arts, dexterous attacks, attacks with monk weapons and unarmed attacks scale with your dexterity instead of your strength if your dexterity is higher, meaning it's interchangeable. Whichever one is higher will be the one to affect the damage. Martial arts, death strikes, attacks with monk weapons and unarmed attacks deal one to four bludgeoning damage unless their normal damage is higher. So you, you get a bit of leeway there. Like if you're picking up some like a cup or something, or just an unarmed attack. It gives you a little leeway. 
Martial Arts bonus unarmed strike. After making an attack with a monk weapon while unarmed or or, or while unarmed, you can make another unarmed attack as a bonus action. So you're going to be able to do a lot of multi hits. That's, I think, going to be the primary fighting style of monks because I I haven't used a monk in general d and and I don't really know anyone that has. So I know a friend of mine is planning on playing one for our multiplayer session, and it's going to be interesting to see how they function. Paladins. Fueled by the oath you swore to uphold justice and righteousness, you are a beacon of hope in dark times. Of course, Lay on Hands is unique to Paladins, lots of big healing. In Divine Senses, you can gain advantage on attack rolls against Celestial, Fiends, and Undead. That one, depending on the situation, this one can actually be really useful, so do not forget about it. And of course, class feature, similar to the other two, we have their own point system to use. We have Oath Charges, which is for certain things like, of course, Lay on Hands, that'll take an Oath Charge. Rangers, I am more than likely going to be doing this one during my main run and multi-class into Druid. Rangers are unrivaled scouts and trackers, honing a deep connection with nature in order to hunt their favorite prey. We, of course, have True Strike. This one is actually super useful and should be used repeatedly. And then Beast Aimer, Find Familiar, will let you summon little companions. And as you level up, you can summon bigger, more ferocious companions. And of course, just as a quick peek, because I know... We have other things to look at in here. I'm only touching the basic outsides of it. Uh, Rangers will be good at melee or long range. Rogues with stealth, skill, and uncanny reflexes. Rogues versatility lets them get the upper hand in almost any situation. And of course, the bread and butter for rogues will be sneak attack, melee, and ranged. This really is super useful if you can abuse this. If you're doing a solo run, I don't recommend rogue because sneak attack is kind of a requirement for you to do damage. So if you have a party of people or if you're making sure um, <clears throat> our vampire boy is coming with us, it it is always good to take advantage of sneak attacks whenever possible. Sorcerer are natural spellcasters drawing on inherent magic from a gift or bloodline. Now, I know some of you are kind of thinking, what's different? What's the difference between sorcerer and wizard? Think of this way. Harry Potter. Yes, they're called wizards and there are people who can just do whatever without a wand. But look at it this way. Harry Potter. They're all wizards. They all learn magic. Therefore, wizard. It is a learned thing. Sorcerer. You can look at sorcerer like the like the anime fairy tale. I mean, if you kind of have it, you kind of have it. And then you just learn and do it yourself. It is a innate thing that you just know how to do. So quickly looking, though, they're going to have a selection of cantrips very much in line with the warlock and the wizards. You know, things like bone shield, acid, true strike is also available in light. And these should be interchangeable up here, which we'll, we'll touch the extra goodies that come with these here in a minute. And of course, spells, chromatic orb and magic missile. Chromatic orb is more useful than you're going to think. If you played the original games and you tried using chromatic orb back then, it was kind of eh back then. But now after early access, we got to see chromatic orb is actually really useful and you should give it a try just to see how much you like it. And of course, class feature spells. Warlock, bound by a pack to an all-powerful patron. Warlocks trade their loyalty for supernatural abilities and unique magic. And of course, Eldritch Blast, Eldritch Blast, Eldritch Blast. It will be in your best interest to take all of the feats you can that increases the capabilities of Eldritch Blast. And Blade Ward. Last feature, we have Warlock spell slots. Wizards, master of the arcane by specializing in individual schools of magic, combining ancient spells with modern research. And if you got to see that infographic for all of the classes that are um, available, <clears throat> wizards have a lot of subclasses available, so pick wisely. We have starting cantrips. We've seen all these before. Mage hand, fire frost, poison, and then all of these. We've got grease, we've got armor, we've got fog cloud, all of the normal stuff. And one thing that they also do have that's pretty unique is Arcane Recovery. You can replenish 
spell slots while out of combat. You cannot restore spell slots above the fifth level. And of course, arcane recovery charge, you'll have a little indicator for that. This way you know when you can and can't use it. All right, now trying to move on just a wee bit. Um, we need to look at all of the extra goodies that come with these classes. So I wanted to do a quick browse through, and of course that wasn't quick at all, but let's look at what comes with it. So barbarian class, there's nothing extra that comes with it at the beginning. Bard down here, <clears throat> you can choose your cantrips. You have a little bit of selection here. And of course this shows you what you can pick. So choose wisely. Bards will also let you choose your spells. Of course, a lot of these seem to be standard with how it was in early access. Pick what you want and be wise about your choices. And then you get a starting instrument. Good old bards love their music. Violin, lyre, lute, flute, and hand drum. Hold on. That's awesome. Oh, I, I, that's, that's going to make me emotional. It's, it's making me remember music from other games. That, that is cool. That is really cool. Um, choice pending. Oh, man. That's going to lead to a lot of fun and probably emotional moments. I, I'm not a bard person, but my friend group, someone is going to be a, a bard. And so I'm, I'm excited to see it. I'm not going to play it, but I'm going to be excited to see it. All right, clerics, of course, we can choose our cantrips. You have a different selection and produce flames will actually be pretty reliable if you want to try that over sacred flame. Making big thing here, though is choosing your domain as a cleric. This is actually really important because it'll give you access to new spells. And of course, it's your identity. This is who you are as a cleric. What do you care about? Do you care about life? Do you care about light, trickery? Do you put priority on knowledge? Do you hunger for war? Are you someone that's tempestuous? Or do you have a love for nature as a cleric? I'm. I'm really happy these options are here because the initial three were kind of doo-doo choices for early access, but I'm glad we have more. Variety matters. Life domain will by default give you cure wounds and bless. And of course, oh, I think this is new. Disciple of life, your devotion empowers your healing spells. When casting a healing spell, the target regains additional HP equal to two plus the spell's level. I do remember this, but I don't remember where because that Archon's new. Light Domain. The Light Domain is offered by deities of... Oh, wait a minute. Light Domain is an aspect of many good deities offering spells to provide that protect and restore the mind, body, and soul. Now I'll be doing this honestly during the multiplayer session. Light Domain. The Light Domain is offered by deities of Justice, Majesty, and Primordial Flame, providing spells that dispel darkness and harm the undead. Basic cantrips that come with this. Oh, and one thing to remember, though, um, because certain subclasses will naturally give you stuff, make sure you go to your actual cantrips and make sure you're not doubling up, because yes, there is mechanics that allow doubling up to be a thing, but I wouldn't recommend it. It also comes with Burning Hands, which is actually really strong in this game, as opposed to the originals. And then Fairy Fire. This one is a very niche usage. You're going to get a lot out of it in the Underdark if you spend time down there. But I would say use this wisely. And then subclass feature, Warding Flare. Shield yourself with Divine Light. Use your reaction to impose disadvantage on an attacker, possibly causing their attacks to miss. I think this one's new. I don't, I don't recall this one. Trickery Domain. <coughs> a domain shared by wicked, chaotic, and mischievous deities alike. Those who channel trickery specialize in deception and illusion magic. 
you of course get Blessing of the Trickster. This is what Shadow Heart technically was, but I didn't I didn't like any of her divine abilities, Blessing of the Trickster, um, Passing Without a Trace as a group. I didn't really get a use out of them. I don't maybe it's just me, but I not 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 a good domain. Charm person can have its uses, but it's hard to use it successfully. And then we asked this guy self. Now this one can actually land a lot of fun. It, there wasn't really a use for it in early access because of where we were, but if you're gonna be frolicking through the city, disguise self will be a good choice to have. Knowledge domain, adaptable and adroit in all manner of language and skills. Your mind is an intellectual cup brimming with exquisite knowledge. You gain command and sleep naturally with this domain. Nature Domain, You're, you embody the vast Viridian power of the natural world, an avatar of the subtle divinity of fruitfall, avian migration, woodland silence, and the landslide's roaring fury. This one is actually kind of surprising for me because I did not think this would be a thing, honestly. Cantrips give a shillelagh. So, I mean... My assumption for the moment is that we're just going to be druid adjacent. So almost like multi-classing, but maybe not. I don't know. I, I'm certain there's going to be some similarities at the very least. Speak with animals and animal friendship come natural with this subclass and the class feature. You learn druid cantrip and you learn a druid cantrip and become proficient in animal handling, nature or survival. Hmm, may have to explore this later, honestly. Tempest Domain. Your, your faith has made you the very thunder that quakes and the quakes the black firmament, the lightning coursing through the veins of a terrible storm. And you are naturally given Thunder Wave. That's a good, okay. And then Fog Cloud. And then your feature will be Wrath of the Storm. Strike at an attacking creature, potentially dealing lightning damage on a failed saving throw. You deal half thunder damage on a roll. Huh. I'm going to imagine a lot of AOE spells, a lot of booming explosions. War Domain. Fortified by holy zeal, you brandish an arsenal of sac sacramental, sacramental savagery to use against those you deem unrighteous. We have Divine Favor and we have Shield of Faith. And our subclass feature, War Priest. When you make an unarmed or weapon attack, you can spend a War Priest charge to make an additional attack as a bonus action. Ooh. So melee, battle, brawling, DPS up close will be the War Domain. I think, I think one of our old companions in the original games was a War Domain Cleric or it was obtainable as a character player. Anyways, this one will be a different kind of fun. And I think a lot of people might get a good use out of this one. Now, something that a lot of us are looking forward to that I enjoy this, I really do. And I don't think Paladins have given it because 5e Paladins have an oath to an ideology instead of an oath to a deity, which it's... That's Gripe with Witches of the Coast, not Larian, so let's just move on. DD Selection! I always loved this in the old games. So I've always loved the idea of it and the lore behind the deities and what happens if you're unaffiliated. It's just, that's a rabbit hole all on its own. It's fun to read, it's fun to learn about. I do advise doing some lore digging about just the deities in general. Because some of them will be important in this game. We got the Dead 3, and then of course there's uh, Salune Shar, etc. It's just, it's a whole thing. God, we got, we got a list. All right, Salune. <clears throat> the Lady of Silver presides over the moon, stars, and navigation. Her powers over the heavens is constantly challenged by her sister Shar, who seeks to plunge the world into eternal shadow. Bahamut, the angel of seven heavens, is the dragon god of justice. His ideals of mercy and just authority keep him locked in an exorable rivalry with his sister Tiamat, who used to be the ruler of the first level of hell, 
but because of lore, she's kind of off to the side, kind of doing whatever right now. She's kind of not in the limelight anymore. I feel like she might come back. Not soon, but yeah. Tempest, give us victory. Oh, I miss Bronwyn. I really do. I always had her in the original playthroughs. Tempest is the Lord of Battles. Overseeing war and its soldiers, he is the embodiment of honorable combat and condemns needless bloodlust. Tyr. Now, old lore. Tyr was kind of... In D&D, certain gods can be associated with multiple worlds and multiple pantheons. There was a time where Earth, our Earth, was technically canon connected to the Forgotten Realms, and Tyr is supposedly one of the ones that crossed over. That is my boy. I, I love Tyr. He is, he is my man. The blind god rules over law and justice, encouraging valiant acts from his followers and relentlessly pursuing oath breakers. Helm. He, this guy kind of played a, a good bit of importance in the original games, if you remember. And he was also really important in general realms lore. The Watcher is an eternal century among the gods, representing guardians across the plains. Planes. After more than a century of fading worship, Helm's power was restored with a second sundering. There's a whole lot of lore behind this man. So if there, if you want a starting point, I would argue you could start there. Ilmatter, the crying god. He protects the oppressed and persecuted. His clergy is sworn to alleviate suffering, even if that means taking on that pain personally. Now this god really is admirable in terms of healing. Mistra, Tyr is my husband. Mistra is my wife. I love both of them. I blame Ed Greenwood for my love of Mistra. I really do. That man is quite literally the father of Forgotten Realms. As the mother of all magic, Mistra oversees the weave and spreads arcane knowledge to mortal spellcasters. Her clerics preserve ancient lore and protect bastions of magical energy. And Quick Teal, DR, the weave is like the invisible framework of the world where magic comes from if there's a tear in the weave that's like oh no there's a bug in the system she's not going to behave correctly and she has a lot of good lore behind her too ogma is the god of inspiration invention sharing knowledge with the world through his bards and clerics unlike many other deities ogma accepts all mortal alignments into his clergy this really is the father of invention in terms of D&D lore. This man has a temple in the middle of the city of Baldur's Gate, and we could explore in the original games, and it's just... That is Da Vinci's workshop, basically, if you go and walk through it. Kelimvor, this man also steeped in lore because of the Dead Three. Fair but distant, Kelimvor guides the dead to their appropriate plane in the afterlife. His clergy provides last rites across Faerun, but also destroy undead that have escaped Kelimvor's judgment. Now he is... He is the current god of the undead. He is not the original, and he has taken that mantle kind of to a higher level than the previous guy, which of course, that's... Uh, oh, I've forgotten his name. We find the temple of the of the original God of the Dead in early access. And of course, there is lore behind him and the Dead Three. Moradin, my dwarven brothers, the Allhammer is a dwarven god worshipped by smiths, artisans and miners alike. He and Lodiger are constantly at odds. And of course, um, is he in here? He is not. Lodiger is Oh, God, if I remember correctly, he is the Underdark equivalent for Dwergar and, of course, just um, general evilness. God, I don't remember his actual portfolio as a deity, but he's a bit removed from the prime pantheon of people. Coralyn Larath. Oh, I can never say his name correctly. Larathian. Coralyn Larathian. What's wrong with me? Creator of the Elves, Coraline oversees the Elven Pantheon as a whole, providing blessings to those who study art, magic, and nature. A good chunk of lore behind this man as well. He's also the reason why Loth is a thing and the whole Dark Seldarin are a thing. Garl Glitter Gold. The watchful protector is the king of gnomish gods, a deity of humor, gem-cutting protection, and trickery. Now, um, 
other than of course being the gnome god in terms of like jewelry and jewel craft this this god is the go-to for that kind of stuff Yondala as the mother of the halfling pantheon Yondala is known for her kindness and open mind encouraging her followers to protect home hearth and nature she really is the one you would want to pray to for harvest she oversees a lot of that kind of stuff Loth Infamous. A lot of us know her. A lot of us love her. A lot of us hate her. The much reviled matriarch of the Drow Pantheon. Loth holds sway over spiders, the Underdark, and the wicked creatures of the demon web pits. Her primary goal is to corrupt all Drow, transforming them into heartless cultists. She is not a nice lady. Honestly, if you love Drow culture, yes, she is the thing to do. She is the thing to worship. But it's like... Drow are inherently evil because of her and not because of what they are, which I mean, what they are is because of her. There's a whole lot of lore behind that. And I honestly do suggest looking into that as well. That is another rabbit hole that is worth exploring. Groomsh. I, I was first exposed to this guy in one of the Drizzt books. He's actually a different kind of admirable. The one I is the orc's patron deity, a god of war, conquest, and victory at all costs. He has held an ancient and immutable grudge against the Elven pantheon since Corlin took his eye. There's more lore behind that. I personally am not too aware of it, only that this man has done some shit. Tiamat! The Mini Maud is a roiling mass of avarice and hate, currently trapped within the Nine Hells. The dragon god of greed eternally plots her escape, as do her many fanatics in the world of Toriel. Quick info nugget. In order to stay relevant, Tiamat has actually killed and usurped godhood from other lesser gods across, not the multiverse, but realm space, other worlds and has ma masqueraded as them. And that, that is one way to gain followers in D&D as, as a god or goddess. You can take the portfolio of another god forcefully, pretend to be them, and then just, yes, you're under a different name, but the idea of that worship going to that name, going to the original, it that ideology of worship theft, <clears throat> might actually play a part in what the Dead Three are doing with the Absolute. That's a theory for a different day, though. Illustre. I have, in terms of Drow lore, I have much love for this for this goddess because of what she's doing. She went with her brethren into the Dark Seldarine. She was the only one that was really given a pass to come back um, by Coralon, but she's like, no. Um, the drow, the children of the drow need to be guided and need to be given a chance to escape Loth. And I really do admire her for that. She is the goddess of good aligned drow, beauty, song, and freedom. The dark maiden desires balance between all races and struggles against her mother Loth's aims. Lathander, the morning lord, is the god of the dawn and the spring, of birth and beginnings. He is invoked to christen both new ventures and new life. His followers embrace growth and renewal and despise the undead. Now, in, in layman terms, if you're an average Joe off in the world, if you're a farmer, if you're a normal person doing whatever, <clears throat> I mean, you may not actually hold to one god as an adventurer kind of would, but like in terms of day to day activities, like if you if you just had a if you just had a child, if you just gave birth, Lathander would be the person to pray to versus like if you want a good harvest, you would then pray to, you know, um, Yondala or actually Maliki would be another one technically. Um, but anyways, that's there's a whole lot of lore here and I'm, I'm I'm already an hour deep. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry for anyone who is still here. Talos. Talos represents the uncanny and destructive force of nature. His followers see life as a set of random effects and a sea of chaos and take what they can. For who can say when Talos will strike next? Eh, a bit of a niche god, I would say. But I mean, if, if you like the embodiment of chaos, Talos is the god for you. Timora is the goddess of luck. Um, Timora is the bright-faced goddess of fortune who favors those who gamble and set out on adventure with the utmost skill and daring. If I remember correctly, there actually is a, an artifact out in the world from Timora where it's just a coin 
if, if I remember correctly, it's supposed to be if you can land it heads up, you're, the next thing you do will give you like luck for completing it or something. Old, old lore. I don't know if it's still a thing though. And lastly, for the chosen gods and goddesses is Maliki, the goddess of forests and the creatures that live within them. This is the one that you hear it holds to. She is a remote and spiritual deity often spoken of in but the quietest of forests. All right, moving on, we got druids. And of course, over here, we have our cantrip selection and that is it for them. Fighters looking down here, we can choose our fighting styles. You can have a special speciality in archery plus two to range weapons. We got defense plus one to a stable wearing arm or dueling when you're wielding a melee weapon that is not two handed or versatile in one hand and no weapon in the other. You deal an extra two damage with that weapon and then great weapon fighting when you roll a one or a two on a damage die for an attack with a two handed melee weapon. That die is rerolled once. I did a quick session with my brother and some other family quite a while back, and he actually took this as a, <laughs> a good old vanilla human fighter. This is actually really good to have. It really is. It really comes in handy. Protection fighting style. When you have a shield, impose disadvantage on an attack against your allies. When you are within 1.5 meters, you must be able to see the attacker. Disadvantage can be good if you choose to pursue that path of playstyle. And two weapon fighting. Deep on my soul, I love dual wielding. When you make an attack with your offhand weapon, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the attack, which is actually really good. Extra damage, because you naturally, if you try to dual wield without extra stuff for it, it won't do as much damage as it should. Monks. Now, sadly, at the beginning, we don't get any extra bits to add to it. Paladin. We have our subclass that we can pick at the beginning. Now, Oathbreaker, that's going to be from early access, easy to do. Whatever ideology you follow, you just break it. And honestly, walking up and forcing a fight is probably going to be what does it if you want to go that path. However, <clears throat> Oath of the Ancients. You fight on the side of light in the cosmic struggle against darkness to preserve the sanctity of life and the beauty of nature. And of course, sadly, we can't choose our gods or goddesses as a paladin. We would actually gain the action healing radiance, which is an AOE healing spell. This one is actually pretty good to use. And for my multiplayer with the group, I'm actually going to try doing a cleric paladin multi-class just to see how that goes for the sake of being a beefy healer. And this subclass comes with Oath of the Ancient Tenants. Oath of the Ancient Paladins abide by the following tenants. Kindle the light through acts of kindness and kindle the light of hope in the bleakest hollows of despair. Shelter the light where love blooms stand against the devilry that would snip its stem. Snip its stem. Preserve your own light. Delight in culture and small joys to preserve the light in your own heart. So I would say in, in a um, poetic way, this is the rules of your oath. Do not break these rules or you will be an oath breaker. Oath of devotion, following the ideal of the knight in shining armor. You act with honor and virtue to protect the weak and pursue the greater good. You will be given holy rebuke, grant an ally a vengeful aura that deals radiant damage to anyone who hits them with a melee attack. If you're doing some kind of like backline caster paladin, which is a thing, they have spells and abilities that allow you to do that successfully. This could work. This could work out really well. And of course, your the tenets of your oath. Courage, stride dauntlessly into action, compassion, show clemency when prudent and lend your armor, lend your arm to those in need. Duty. Tend your responsibilities, obey just laws, and support those entrusted to your care. And I just realized Oath looks like it gives us a blue, blue, blue uh, attire. Boop. Don't forget, I have shirts for most of the classes. If you want to grab them, they're on my shop. You can find the link down below. Oath of Vengeance. I love that coloration. I. Oh, that's. Can I move you? 
Oh, I can't move you. I love this outfit. <laughs> I, I would actually wear this to Ren Fair or something like that. I, I really love this outfit. Okay. <laughs> you have set aside even your own purity to right wrongs and deliver justice to those who have committed the most grievous sins. So yeah, I, I guess you're going to be all about vengeance, whatever the cost. Um, let's see what comes with it. Actions. Inquisitor's Might. You are an ally's weapon attacks, deal an additional two radiant damage, and can daze enemies for one turn. That'll be pretty useful. The tenants of your oath. Fight the greater evil, exerting your wisdom. Identify the higher morality in any given instance and fight for it. No mercy for the wicked. Chas chasten those who dole out their villainy by wiping their blight from the world forever. Okay, so I know there is a lot of like issue with people wanting to play paladins in early access where they would be oath breakers way too easily. Oath of Vengeance wasn't a thing in Early Access. So I feel like the way people want to play Paladins, Oath of Vengeance is going to be the way to go. Um, fight for the Great Evil, um, No Mercy for the Wicked. I feel like a lot of those actions people would trigger to become an Oathbreaker will be null if they choose Oath of Vengeance. So if if you're seeing this and you're really worried about being an Oathbreaker, like annoyingly becoming an oath breaker because it's like, why did that happen? Well, it did. Now I got to go fix it. Oath of Vengeance might be the way to go for you. Rangers, of course, down here, we're going to be able to choose our favorite enemy. This is something that's pretty integral to Rangers. Studying the tactics and abilities of certain creatures has granted you a set of abilities that is useful in a variety of situations. First option is Bounty Hunter. We gain proficiency in investigation. Creatures you hit with ensnaring strike have disadvantage on their saving throws. And this brings us Find Familiar Beast Hammer. Okay, so that's going to be there regardless. Keeper of the Veil. You specialize in hunting creatures from other planes of existence. You gain proficiency in Arcana and can cast protection from evil and good. And this will give us protection from evil and good. Mage Breaker. I think a lot of y'all are going to like this one. You have a history of battling spellcasters. You gain proficiency in Arcana and can cast True Strike, which I think we have already. Ranger Knight. Now, now, now this is a fun one when you get when you start getting a little higher. You have sworn to serve a crown or nation and seek to bring its foes to ruin. Gain skill proficiency in history and armor proficiency with heavy armor. Um, whenever we acquire Minsk, I am willing to bet that he is technically a ranger knight in terms of the way he kind of acts. Maybe multi-classing into a barbarian just because like back in the day, he was a pure ranger without a subclass in the game, but we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Sanctified Stalker. You swore to hunt the enemies of a holy or druidic order. You gain proficiency in religion and can cast Sacred Flame, which is of course a, a fairly okay cantrip, honestly. And of course, with ranges we get natural explorer, years of traveling in the wild have made you particularly attuned to beasts or adept at surviving in certain environments. You can be beast tamer, you have cultivated a strong bond with animals. You can cast fine familiar without expending a spell slot. Urban Tracker, an expert at navigating the wild within the city, you gain proficiency in sleight of hand. Wasteland wanderers for cold, fire, and poison. You spend endless days surviving desolate tundras. You gain resistance to cold damage, resistance to fire damage, and resistance to poison damage. These would be pretty niche. I would say don't bother with these unless you think you have a particular reason for it. In traditional D&D, those might have better uses based on your campaign setting, but based on BG3, Maybe fire? I, I I wouldn't recommend those three, honestly. Rogues over here, we don't have anything to choose from. Sorcerer, we have our cantrip selections, a lot of standard stuff. And we have our spells, all of the standard stuff as well. And we got to see Ice Knife earlier. We have all of our old stuff and shield. I don't remember that being an early access. When you are about to be hit by an enemy, increase your AC by five. You take no damage from magic miss oh you take no that is interesting i don't remember that being a thing in early access i might be forgetting but it's nice to see 
Now here's the important part. For sorcerers, we have Wild Magic, Draconic Bloodline, and Storm Sorcery. These are all fun, and Storm is, of course, the new one. Wild Magic. Your powers come from the ancient forces of chaos. They churn within you, waiting to burst free at any time. And with this comes Tides of Chaos. You can activate to gain advantage on your next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. But this increases the chance of a wild magic surge afterwards. Now, let me let me just kind of hone in on this for a moment. Now, the the ability of wild magic in general as this class Unruly magic sparks and fizzes through, fizzles through your veins. For sorcerers, each time you cast a spell of level one or higher, your magic might surge and trigger a random magical effect. For barbarians, each time you rage, a random magical effect will trigger. And I forgot to mention, yeah, barbarians can, can tap into this too, but we'll, we'll get there when we get there. And of course, wild magic right there. Okay, Draconic Bloodline. This is the one that I also tried to play a bit during Early Access. You have the ability to choose your scale from your ancestor. Your veins carry demo Draconic Magic, the result of a powerful dragon ancestor, which is, of course, magic is in your blood, and that blood happens to be from a dragon. Your class feature is Draconic Resilience for your hit points. Your HP max is increased by one for each sorcerer level. It may not seem like much, but as you... For the sake of not being a squishy caster, as you level up, it, it, it adds up. It really does. Because max level 12, extra 12 HP, eh, that little, little bit can go a long way. Draconic Resilience. Dragon-like scales cover parts of your skin when you aren't wearing armor. Your base armor class is 13. Not bad, honestly, for a caster. And one thing to remember, as you level, I think it's level 6, level 7... It was like right on the cusp of early access um, limitability. You can do double the damage of what your dragon powers will allow you to do. They give you extra bonuses. And actually, before I move on to Storm, down here, Dragon Ancestor. This actually matters. You can, <clears throat> you can change the aesthetics down here. There will be a button for it, so you don't have to stick with it, but... Each of these gives you a bonus. And of course, we got fire, acid, lightning, cold, poison, fire again, and cold, lightning, acid, fire again. They're a bit different. So we'll get burning hands. We got grease. We have witch's bolts. We have armor of the Agath Agathies. Ray of sickness. Cold fire. Disguise self. Silver. Featherfall, Bronze, Fog Cloud, Copper, Tasha City's Laughter, Brass, Sleep. And just reading off one of these. At level 6, okay, it's going to say it anyways. Spells that deal fire damage are more powerful and you become resistant to fire damage. And of course, that type of ability applies to all of the elements based on your dragon ancestry. And in terms of the spells that it gives you, a lot of that has to do with the personalities and the behaviors associated with those dragon types, which that's another lore dump you can look into. It is pretty interesting on its own. Without trying to rush into this, here we go, Draconic Bloodline. You can, of course, change the way you look in here, and you can even change your coloration based on however you want. So you're not locked into your, your Draconic appearance based on that selection. You can change it to look however, however you want. and. If you really want to, you can remove it. It's entirely up to you how you want to customize it. Storm Sorcery. Here's the new one that I know nothing about. I haven't even looked it up. Weather Crackling. Weather Crackling with the energy of ancient deluges or pierced by gales and hurricanes, your lineage is a strange tapestry scrawled by a tempest. What does that mean? Do, do we have... Do we have deity blood? Like what? Tempestuous magic. After you cast a level one spell or higher, you can fly as a bonus action until the end of your turn without receiving opportunity attacks. I'm gonna need to look into this later. 
Coming back over to Warlocks, we got our Cantrip Selection. Do not get rid of Eldritch Blast. No matter what you're planning, do not get rid of Eldritch Blast. And of course, we have our Subclass Selection at the beginning. The Fiend, the Great Old One, and Archfey. I really do hope these have more added to them as we level because, I mean, the Fiend, I... We, the Fiend is where we got stuff to kind of give bonuses to Eldritch Blast, but the Great Old One kind of didn't have much. And of course, Archfey is new. And if you're confused as to why Archfey is there, it's just Warlock isn't about working with a demon for power. It's about making a contract with a higher power in general. So, of course, the Fiend, you know, demons and whatnot, um, maybe a double Great Old One. That's more so the Far Realm, you know where the Alithids and Aboleths and all of those, you know, Cthulhu-esque creatures come from. And then Archfey will be an actual Fey creature, not deity, but a strong being from the Fey wild, the, the Fey realm. Okay, the Fiend. Warlocks in service to the Fiends work towards corruption, destructive ends, intentionally or otherwise, and receive hellish blessings in return. This will give you Armor of Agathis and Arms of Hadar. And this one's actually pretty good, and you can... You can make a pseudo death knight with warlocks and maybe paladins and arms of Hadar will be really, really good to have. The feature this comes with when you reduce a hostile creature to zero HP, this gift from your patron grants you for temporary HP. Now, I can also confirm that if you stack this up with kills, it will not go beyond four HP. So I would say if you're trying to min max this extra temporary HP be careful with it but I, I I don't say I don't recommend doing that just blast them if you can the great old one warlocks bound to eldritch beings in the far realm work towards inscrutable goals gaining strange powers over entropy in the mind this one naturally gives you a dissonant whispers and Tasha City's laughter but the feature that comes with it when you land a crit against a creature, the creature and any nearby enemies must succeed a wisdom saving throw or become frightened until the end of their next turn. I don't remember this in early access. I really don't. But, but it gives us a peek that the, that the great old one will be pretty good at, at um, crowd control abilities. That's my assumption. Don't take my word for it, though. Do not quote me on that. The Arch Fey. Graced by a lady or lord of the Fae, you are imbued with all of the sumptuous and scary qualities of your patron's extraordinary realm. And it naturally gives us fairy fire and sleep. And an action, Fae presence, charm or frighten nearby foes with the Fae wilds beguiling, disturbing magics. This is an AOE. Okay, forget what I said about this being the CC subclass, the Archfey. That is an AOE around you that can apply charm and frame. That is nuts. It, if you want to be a scary death knight, if you want to like try to fudge a subclass that doesn't exist without modding, do this. <laughs> do, do that. That'll be great. And lastly, you can, of course, choose your spells and then something that'll be learned later on, but is early for Warlocks, Hellish Rebuke, Hex. Those can be pretty useful as well. And finally, Wizards, you have your cantrip selection, you have your spell selection, nothing really new. It's just a big selection. And if I recall correctly, you will be able to choose your school of spellcraft at level two, three. I think that's where it lies. And then beforehand, the bit about wild magic with barbarians, that also is going to appear at like level two or three. You can be like a totemic barbarian, a wild barbarian. I really wish, even if we can't pick it now, I really wish Larian would have like... For the sake of helping newer players figure out what they want to do, at least show us what's coming. Show us what subclasses are coming inside of the actual character creation. That would have been pretty amazing. This way you don't get deep and have regret. And it's like, oh yeah, you can respect. And it's just like... 
gosh, I might be remembering it correctly. I hope respecking doesn't just give us points for the class we chose. I hope it lets us actually redo the whole class. Because then people will be spending like a good whole afternoon at the respecker trying to figure out what they want. Backgrounds is something kind of introduced when 5e was new, if I recall correctly. And this can actually give you some bonuses that might be worth giving some thought to. We have Alkali, Charlton, Criminal, Entertainer, Folk Hero, Guild Artist, and Noble, Outlander, Sage, Soldier, and Urchin. And for flavor's sake, this is your character's background um, that you came from before really becoming an adventurer. This is what you grew up in, pretty much. Alkali, you have spent your life in service to a temple, learning sacred rites and providing sacrifices to the gods or gods. God or gods you worship, serving the gods and discovering their sacred works will guide you to their greatness. And I mean, generally speaking, all of these will give you just skills as the bonus. This will give you insight and religion bonuses. Charlatan, you're an expert in manipulation, prone to exaggeration and more than happy to profit from it. Bending the truth and turning allies against each other will lead to greater success down the road. This gives you deception and sleight of hand bonuses. Criminal. You have a history of breaking the law and survive by leveraging less than legal connections. Profiting from criminal enterprise will lead to great opportunities in the future. And this, of course, gives you bonuses to deception and stealth. Entertainer, you live to sway and subvert your audience, engaging common, cow common crowds and high society alike, preserving art and bringing joy to the hapless and downtrodden heightens, heightens your charismatic aura. You get acrobatics and performance. Folk hero, you are a champion of the common people, challenging tyrants and monsters to protect the helpless. Saving innocence in imminent danger will make your legend grow. Animal handling and survival. Guild artisan, your skill in a particular craft has earned you membership in a mercantile guild, offering privileges and protection while engaging in your art. Repairing and discovering rare crafts will bring new inspiration. Insight and persuasion come with this one. And also, generally speaking, you will have dialogue options tied to these things. So it can, like even outside of the skills, having these chosen carefully will actually come in handy. Noble, you were raised in a family among the social elite. Accustomed to power and privilege, accumulating renown, power and loyalty will raise your status. You have skills in history and persuasion. Outlander, you grew up in the wilds, learning to survive far from the comforts of civilization. Surviving unusual hazards of the wild would enhance your prowess and understanding. You are skilled in athletics and survival. Then we have Sage. This is the one that I usually chose during early access. You are curious and well-read with an unending thirst for knowledge. Learning about rare lore of the world will inspire you to put this knowledge to greater purpose. You gain arcana and history. You are a soldier trained in the battlefield in battlefield tactics and combat. Having served in a militia, mercenary company, or officer corps, show smart tactics and bravery on the battlefield to enhance your prowess. For what it's worth, this is this this would be Abdel's background because he was a cell sword. Uh, or maybe not. The books aren't canon. Anyways, this one will give you athletics and intimidation. And then Urchin. I think Shadowheart is this one, technically. After surviving a poor and bleak childhood, you know how to make the most of every... the most out of very little. Using your street smarts bolsters your spirits for the journey ahead. You are given sleight of hand and stealth. Now, moving on to ability scores. <laughs> this is something I can't teach you. Not in this video that has already reached an hour and a half. I cannot teach you ability scores. The best thing I can tell you is read the descriptions for each of these. A lot of these are self-explanatory, but it is best to read them. You need to figure out what is your dump stat, what is the required stat for your class, because certain classes require certain things, like bards need charisma, wizards need intelligence, 
Um, if you're a fighter, you're going to want to dump everything into constitution so you can have a higher health pool. Um, for, you know, rangers, dexterity and or strength, you have to try to figure out what's what. And a lot of times your classes should tell you what you need or it'll say it somewhere. So just as an example, strength, muscles and physical power. This affects your effectiveness with melee weapons, also determines how far you can jump and how much you can carry. Each of these will tell you what they can do. Dexterity can affect armor class too. For those of you who want to try to min-max or do something special, this might be, you might want to squeeze something in there extra. Con, that is your HP, intelligence, memory and mental power. This is for wizards. Wisdom, sense of intu senses and intuition, and improved spellcasting for clerics, druids, and rangers. Um, charisma, it's for bards, paladins, sorcerers, warlocks. A lot of these will tell you what, what they are and what you need. But at the same time, if you want to look up a guide, you can look up a guide. It's it's just kind of one of those things you got to really figure out for yourself. But it's I can't like fully explain this in this video because that actually will take quite a while. Um, but with that in mind, though, if you really don't know what to do, I mean, you can move these around, you can do whatever you want with them, but also you can click this. Use recommended values for your chosen class. If you truly don't care about learning this, you don't have to. You just click recommended and you should be good to go. So for example, we have a druid right here, right? So strength isn't necessarily needed. Dexterity will be good to have for the sake of a bit of extra AC. A little bit of balance and a con will help you because you can play druids any different way you want. Intelligence, suck as much out of it as you can. It is not needed. Wisdom, a lot of your spells in general are buffed by your wisdom score. And of course, the star will denote the primary ability of your class. This will move depending on what class you have selected. And of course, charisma, this will help with dialogue options, but there are also other classes where their spells and abilities will be modified and buffed by charisma. And it's just, it's a good thing to make sure that you look out for. Now for ability bonuses, this is a bit new or recent events. So let me go up to the erases. Now, I know I haven't touched this yet. We were about to get to it. It used to be, so 5e, they had this in early access, they decided to do away with it. It used to be that each of these classes, depending on, of course, their backgrounds, their upbringings, their society, you would have plus two to dexterity, um, plus two to charisma, Dragonborn would have plus two to charisma, Drow would have dexterity, humans would naturally have plus two, you can put anywhere. Um, I think Githyanki were con, I think dwarves were con, I know halflings and gnomes were con. Um, Oh no, one of them was wisdom. Anyways, each race used to have their designated bonuses, but Larian has decided to do away with that, which is what these assigned bonuses are for. Plus two and plus one. Basically, it gives you the freedom to choose, so you don't have to min-max by choosing class, specifically for min-maxing in terms of these. So you can apply these however you want for those bonuses. Um, but it looks like we can't double up. Which it's a little sad, but I mean, it is what it is. And of course, depending on what your class is, when you start the game, you have to prepare spells. That is a mechanic in D&D in general. Yes, you know a whole lot of good spells and stuff, but you got to like take time to sit down and remember them so you're ready to use them. And of course, that's what this is meant for. So before you start the game, make sure you come. If you have a spell class cast, if you spell casting class, come into here for prepared spells and make sure you pick what you want to start with. Okay, and now for races, we of course have all of these goodies to go with. The new ones being Dragonborn and Half Orcs. Elves with ethereal countenance and long lifespans. Elves are at home with nature's power, flourishing in light and dark alike. Now, all of them have racial speeds that are slightly different. Um, I don't think you really got to worry about these. If you want to, definitely compare them. However, they will still have other unique bonuses. Elven weapon training, proficiency with long swords, short swords, and short bows and long bows. We have dark vision, which you can see in the dark. You have fate ancestry, which means you have advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic can't put you to sleep. 
Tieflings, descendant from Devils of the Nine Hells. Tieflings face constant s suspicion in Faerun. Thankfully, their arcane abilities make them natural survivors. They, lore-wise, they face more prejudice than the drow do, just because it's like, oh, demon, run. And I mean, yeah, you, you see where that goes. And tieflings, of course, will be given dark vision as well, and they will naturally have hellish resistance. You have resistance to fire damage, taking only half from it. So if you, if you want to actually min-max some stuff, you could do a dragon sorcerer tiefling and just walk through fire as if it was nothing. There, there are combinations you can do. Drow, driven to the Underdark. Most Drow have adopted a ruthless pragmatism while the Lothsworn delight in the goddess's evil tenants and Seldarin reject her attempt to overthrow the leader of the Elven Pantheon. They will give you draw weapon training, which is in rapier, short swords, and hand crossbows. You also have dark vision, a greater dark vision because, you know, they live in the Underdark. They can see for twice the distance than the others. And then they too have fate ancestry because TLDR in lore, they are elves. They are true elves. They were just changed. So, of course, there's going to be similarities. Humans, y'all's redeeming qualities used to be the plus one, plus two added to wherever. I noticed there was discussions wondering what are they going to do to balance that out since, you know, they're humans. So let's see what they gave us. This should be new. Um... Civil Militia, you have proficiency with spears, pikes, halberds, and glaives, and armor proficiency with light and shields. I mean, compared to the, prof to the proficiencies that other classes, that other races are getting, this seems pretty good. This is actually a good thing. And I guess as a quick reminder for those of you who don't really remember, um, armor proficiency, uh, your armor and shield from blocking spellcasting or imposing disadvantage on attack rolls. It, it, it prevents disadvantage on attack rolls and other downsides. So it's it's good. And of course, human versatility. Select an additional skill to be proficient in. That's good. Your carrying capacity is increased by a quarter. I think the original rumor was the only bonus was going to be the increased carrying capacity, but. As the trade-off for what they did with the with the stat bonuses, I think this is actually pretty good. It it, it really does embody the idea that humans are versatile creatures. Um, the most common face in favor in humans are known for their tenacity, creativity, and endless capacity for growth. <clears throat> Gith Yankee. There's a whole lot of lore behind them as a race. If you want to look it up, Spelljammer. <clears throat> Love that setting. With a ruthlessness born from mind flare enslavement, Githyanki ride the astral sea atop red dragons, bringing their silver swords and psionic might to bear against any trace of a lithid menace. And these actually will give you some extra bits. Our astral knowledge gain proficiency in all skills of a chosen ability. That is new. That is new. Um, and if you're kind of confused by that, so skills, things like history, arcana, etc. Those are tied to abilities. So like intelligence will give you, you know, arcana and stuff like that. Um, so there's six abilities, strength, dexterity, con. Going deeper into that. Does it specify which ones? It doesn't. Unless I'm blind, it does not. Um, basically, it means you you get a whole lot of extra bonuses to your used skills. Cantrips will naturally have magic mage hand. And then they are given martial prodigy. So relentless training gives you armor proficiency and light and medium, as well as proficiency with short sword, long sword, and great sword. Ha ah, laddie, it's good to see you again. Dwarves, as durable and unyielding as their homes of stone, dwarves are some of the finest warriors, miners, and smiths in Faerun. Dwarven combat training, you have prof with battle axe, hand axe, light hammer, and war hammer. They also have dark vision naturally because, you know, they live in mountains. And dwarven resilience, you have advantage on saving throws against poison and resistance to poison damage. They're very hardy folk, and they are very strong. I have much respect for, for the Dwarven race. 
Half elves, curious, ambitious, and versatile, half elves are welcome everywhere, but struggle without a community to call their home. It's like they face the opposite of prejudice. Like, I, I don't. They have a foot in two worlds, and so they, I would say, have the charisma to work with that, but I feel like they're naturally very social people. And so that's why they need a community, because if they're alone, then it's just like being an extrovert without a group. I mean, I can't imagine that because, you know, I'm an introvert. But anyways, they have their own civil militia, um, prof with pikes, halberds and glaives, which, yeah, it comes from their human ancestry, honestly. <clears throat> they also have dark vision from their elven ancestry and, of course, fey ancestry, advantage saving throws against charmed and you get people to sleep. So it's it's a it's a it's a good bit of half and half, honestly. Halflings, small yet capable. Halflings prefer the comforts of home and hearth, but their natural luck and dexterity make them fine adventurers. That's a Tolkien reference right there. God, I love those movies. I, I love that world. Um, you want to make Frodo? Now's your chance to do it. Or you can make Sam. I know there's cookware in the game. You, you, you can make Sam, find some cookware, um, maybe do a warrior barbarian, unarmed, unarmed proficiency, whatever, and just smack people with the kitchen appliance. Anyways. Halflings bring you luck. When you roll a one on attack roll, ability check, or saving throws, you can reroll the die, but you gotta use the new die. And then brave. You have advantage on saving throws against being frightened. Gnomes, small, clever, and energetic. Gnomes use their long lives to explore Faerun's brightest corners and darkest depths. They have gnome cunning, advantage on int, whiz, and charisma saving throws. Dragonborn, their bonuses come from someplace else. I'll get there in a minute. A proud race that values clan and skills above all else. Once slain by dragons, they strive to be self-sufficient, not wanting to be beholden to anyone, not even the gods. They also have a really interesting backstory for how they came to be, how they came to Faerun from, or, um, how they came to Torel from Abair, because there's a lot there, and I suggest looking into it. And half orcs. Creatures of intense emotion, half-orcs are more inclined to act than contemplate, whether the rage burning their bodies compels them to fight, or the love filling their hearts inspires act of incredible kindness. Now, I mean, for D&D homebrew, of course, you can do whatever for the half-races, but in terms of BG, all of the half-races, you are half-human. And this will give us dark vision. We will have relentless endurance. If he reaches zero HP, you will get back up with one HP instead of becoming downed. And you will have savage attacks. We talked about this a bit in the previous video. You land, when you land crits with a melee weapon, your damage dice are tripled instead of doubled. This, this is by far in terms of melee damage, the strongest race in the game because it, it is going to be nuts if you actually can pull this off repeatedly. All right, now for touching sub races. I know this doesn't really seem like it's in order, but uh, just look at the timestamps if you need them. So in terms of sub races, we actually have a lot to go through. <clears throat> elves will have the sub races of high and wood. High elves, heirs of the mystical Feywild. High elves value magic in all its forms. And even those who do not study spellcraft can manipulate the weave and they are naturally given the cantrip fireball. Wood Elves. These elves spend their recursive lives in the Faerun Forest. Decades of training in archery and camouflage are enhanced by an otherworldly swiftness. And they naturally have um, fleet of foot, which just means they get extra movement speed. This may not seem like much, but in terms of actual combat, because it's a bonus, it, I've noticed this actually goes a long way. All right, tiefling sub races. We got Asmodeus, Mephistopheles, and Zariel. Bound to Nessus, the deepest layer of the hells. These tieflings inherited the ability to wield fire and darkness from the archdevil Asmodeus's infernal bloodline. Now, in terms of the hierarchy of devils, Asmodeus—he's a big boy. He—he he, he sits at the at the bottom layer, and he 
basically king of all hell. It's he is worth looking into by himself. And they are naturally given the can trip produce flame. Mephistopheles, descendant from the Archdevil Mephistopheles, these tieflings are gifted with a particular affinity for arcane magic, and they are naturally given Mage Hand. And this is another good one, Zariel. Thinking about who Zariel is, where she came from, what she's doing, what she cares about, I find it weird that we have tieflings with her bloodline. Uh, but I would assume... Well, for one thing, if you go and find Karlak as a Zariel Tifling, I'm fairly certain that's going to spark some interesting discussions. I would assume maybe not traditional Tifling creation, but maybe Zariel, you know, did some just, you know, blood work, trickled it out, fed it into Tieflings or created Tieflings a different way. I, Sure, we'll learn more about that later, but it just seems to me it seems weird that it's here. Tieflings from Zariel's bloodline are empowered with martial strength and can channel searing flame to punish their enemies, and they are given thaumaturgy. Drow, it is based on basically which goddess has been giving you um, your life, which goddess looks over you. You have Lulth's Sworn Drow and Seldarine. Raised by Lulth's cult in the city of Menzel Baranzan. Hey, that's Drizzt's home place. Uh, these drow embody the virtues of their corrupt and merciless goddess. Lulth marks her followers with bright red eyes, so those in the Underdark will learn to fear them on sight. And because of how dark things are, those red eyes, they, they're supposed to glow, I think. They, they, intimidation. Yeah, we got red eyes here. Seldarine Drow. Of course, that red is taken from them. They got eyes like moon, which Seldarine is a moon goddess, technically. Seldarine Drow can be found seeking allies from all over Faerun, aiming to settle their conflict with Lolth and each other by any means necessary. Now, these people are also truly trying to earn a place in the world, much like how the Dragonborn and the Tiefling are. And I feel like there's a lot of natural kinship there if they were to befriend one another. Humans, let's be honest, their sub races are half elves and half orcs. There's there's no actual sub race to pick here. Githyanki, um, they are hyper xenophobic, so I mean, if there is a sub race, it would be the Githrazai, and that's a whole nother level of xenophobia for them, which, I mean, we have nothing here. Dwarves, we have Gold, Shield, and Dwergar. That's the new one. <clears throat> gold Dwarves are known for their confidence and keen intuition, the culture of their deep kingdom values, family, ritual, and fine craftsmanship. And this one gives you Dwarven Toughness, your HP is increased by one, and increases by one every time you gain a level. Oh, so if you combine that with a Sorcerer, a Dragon Sorcerer, that would be like, what, by the time you get to level 12, extra 24 hit points? So, you want to min-max, you want to do some combinations, a Sorcerer, Dragon Sorcerer, Gold Dwarf. All that extra HP, that's going to be roughly 24, 25 extra HP total by the time you're at the end of the game at max level. That's a lot. That, that adds up. Shield Wars. Great losses in ancient wars against goblins and orcs have led these dwarves to adopt a cynical mindset. But they will endure anything to restore their ancestral homelands. Tolkien! Erebor, I see you! Dwarven armor training is what they are given. You have proficiency with light and medium armor. You are bred for battle. You are going to be knocking some heads. And Dwargar, dwarves of the deep, living alongside the door, um, the drow race. They're they're equally pretty nasty, honestly, but they also care for the same things that dwarves do. Once enslaved by the Eldritch Mind Flayers, Dwergar adapted to freedom with harsh practicality. 
Their cold demeanors and gift of stealth are well known throughout the Underdark. They of course have superior dark vision like the Drow do. And then they have to wear our resilience. You have advantage on saving throws against illusions and against being charmed or paralyzed, which is pretty good. Half elves, and basically your half lineage comes from the types of elves that are available. You have ha you have high half elf. A touch of the Feywild remains in half elves with this bloodline. And even those untrained in magic possess a hint of wild power, you gain the cantrip from high elves. Wood half elves, you gain the same feature as well. Like their wood elf parent, these half elves have a qu have a quickened stride and an eye for stealth. Yet many break away from isolation in Faerun's forest to explore the rest of the realms. Why is th hmm? I don't know why I find that oddly pretty for for a, for a elf character. It's the hair. I like that hair. That's that's what it is. I like the hair. Drow half elves. Um, most half drow result from liaisons between the Seldarine drow and the surfacers. While half drow inherited a few magical gifts, they aren't usually raised in the Underdark, and they're given dancing lights. Now, I know drow and specifically will gain more racial bonuses as they level. I don't think the half drows will gain those same ones, but it could be different. I don't remember. They don't show us everything in character creation. Halflings have light foot and strong heart. Stealthy but social, these halflings travel all over Faerun to make names for themselves. Their feature is you have advantage on stealth checks. If you if you are trying to do some kind of Tolkien um, halfling, that that might be the way to go for you. Strongheart. Legend has it that dwarven blood gave strong hearts their hardiness, resistance to poison, and are a wellspring of endurance. These halflings easily hold their own. It could possibly say that um, Sam is a strong heart. Uh, their, their feature is you have advantage on saving throws against poisons and resistance to poisons. Now, for what it's worth, this is basically a half breed, half, 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 half halfling and half dwarf. Pretty much. Gnomes, we have rock, forest, and deep. One of these is new, I don't remember which. The most commonly seen gnomes on Faerun's surface, rock gnomes are named as such for their hardiness and affinity for metal. They have a bit of dark vision and also artificer's lore. Add twice your proficiency bonus to history checks. So, I mean, proficiency bonuses means you have a set bonus given to the skills that you learned. And this of course means that can be doubled. Forest gnomes, uh, even smaller than their cousins and twice as reclusive, forest gnomes are a rare sight in Faerun. They master magic and craftsmanship in their distant idyllic groves. They are given speak with animals and have a feature for dark vision. And then deep gnomes. So we, we, we got to meet one of these as a potential camp companion um, that we rescued from the windmill. More guarded than their surface cousins, deep gnomes survive in the Underdark with dark vision and skillful stealth. So, of course, superior dark vision, as is, I guess, natural with all Underdark um, races. And then stone camouflage. You have advantage on stealth checks. Dragonborn. Okay. This is the deep one. We're approaching two hours. I am so sorry for anyone who is actually raw dogging this whole video. So similar to similar to how the draconic sorcerers are, you choose your bloodline basically. And the bloodlines available for the Dragonborn are black, blue, brass, bronze, copper, gold, green, red, silver, and white. I I will read one of these. I I will read silver dragons um despite no ancestral links to the mighty creatures these dragonborn share the glintening shine and scorching cold breath of silver dragons now for the sake of the game i understand why they wrote it like that but for the sake of true D, &D lore um 
I mean, once upon a time, they were created to be subservient to dragons. And of course, each of them was molded by said dragon kind to serve that type of dragon better. So, like I said, Dragonborn, they have good lore. I recommend looking into it. But um, looking at the actual abilities given to them. So each class, of course, is tied to an element. They are given a breath weapon. You can breathe fire as a Dragonborn. So, of course, uh, black dragons will have acid breath. You know what? Let's just let's just keep the features together. They'll have acid breath and then draconic ancestry for all of these will also be tied to the element. The blood of ancient dragons flows through your veins. Aha. Contrary to this. Contrary to that. Um, blood of ancient dragons flows through your veins. You are resistant to acid damage. So, like I said, each of these will have you. You are resistant to said element and you deal a breath weapon of that element. So black will have acid damage and resistance. Blue will have lightning damage and resistance. Brass will have fire damage and resistance. Bronze will have lightning damage and resist and resistance. Copper will have acid damage and resistance. Gold will have fire damage and resistance. Green will have poison damage and resistance. Red will have fire damage and resistance. Silver will have cold damage and resistance and white will have cold damage and resistance. A lot of these look really, really good. I am honestly just astounded that Larian got these to look so good. And if you caught glimpses of the draconic section for the last stuff they talked about with the panel. It made it seem like they had to reinvent technology. I mean, well, they, they, they remade this whole engine from the ground up, obviously. But I mean, I th they had to I get the sense they tweaked it more so that the scales, the lighting, the colors. This is nuts. For actual character creation, body character bodies. Like they they pulled off something really amazing here. I as a developer, I admire them for this. This is honestly, I mean, Sven was right. This is revolutionary. This is are their eyes animated. Their eyes have animations. I didn't notice that. Look at that. This is amazing, y'all. This is just their eyes are glowing with fire and it's just they look amazing. They really do. Now, um, with that in mind, I have to remind I have to um, specify in terms of body types. Um, not all of them have the big body types. It is just elves, tieflings, drow and humans, um, gith, dwarf, don't have it. Half elves have it because, you know, they share the same body type, the body similarities. Halflings don't have it. Half orcs don't have it. Dragons don't have it. And gnomes don't have it. But anyways, trying to finalize everything, the half orcs actually don't have um, sub races. So as far as races go, that's the end of the line. That's it. Um, the only thing left for this two hour long mega video here is the actual important part the actual part after two hours of me just talking the actual part that anybody cares about editing the appearance now this could take ages in its own right so i will try my best to not linger here honestly so let's just start off with humans let's just go vanilla to begin with So of course, we got a bunch of different faces. We got different skin colors. Um, we have multiple voices. Go. We have guy, gir girl, other guy, other girl, guy, other girl. More of those wretched things. There's magic keeping this chest sealed. Where to next? 
So we got eight voices to choose from. Four guys and four girls. We didn't have that many in early access. Oh, I... What was that? I'm going to be stuck trying to figure out my, my voice for a while. Um... So here for identity, it does also let us choose the body types up here. And of course, we can still choose the identity. Oh, I forgot they added this. There, this was talked about in a quick snippet, but I forgot they added this. You can choose your actual identity identity. You can identify as a guy, identify as a girl, or identify as non-binary. Now, nah. did you did you did you see the difference? Guess what? No difference. This is based entirely on your body type while your identity is completely separate. In terms of inclusion, I mean, although I personally don't think about that stuff, still, good job, Larian. I know a lot of people are actually going to really be happy about this. And it's it's a first, honestly, to see this in a game. And it's, it's just really neat to see it just available. Now, of course, moving on, we can choose our skin color tones, and this should be doable regardless of what, of what race we choose. And regardless of what race we choose, we have no limitations. We can be as purple, pink, pale as much as we want. We can look however we want, regardless of who we are. Mechanically speaking, who we are. So we can also choose from a set number of scarring. Let's get closer to her face. These, are, these scars actually seem pretty good compared to what Early Access had. And that's interesting. Got a burn mark. And one thing they briefly talked about, um, we got sliders. We got new sliders. Um, so let's clear your face real quick. Maturity. Yeah. Young, old, young, old, right in the middle. <laughs> I just had a strange thought. This is someone's mom. This is <laughs> this. You, you can this by itself is amazing. It really is. Um, okay, let me reset that. We can actually add freckles too. It's it's the little things. It really is. They really add up. And then oh, freckle intensity. I'm sorry. Let's look at that. Ooh. That's neat. That really is neat. And I know, what is it? Um, I guess gingers have a higher chance of having freckles on their face naturally. This is cool. Having this as an option. This is awesome. And something that a lot of y'all may not have known the name for, but you may have seen someone with it. Matilda this is an actual skin condition people have. And it's just, this is wild. Having all of this just available. This is nuts. This is amazing. This, this, this is for gaming. This really is revolutionary, I would say. So we can also choose body art. We have all of our tattoos to choose from. Um, there's a lot here. Um, this part alone could also take up a lot of your time just trying to figure out what you want to do. Because then, and they did say they added a whole lot of extra as well. And oh, that's cool. And that looks like that goes up into your noggin. Like, for the sake of curiosity, let's. Ooh! That's really. I didn't even think. I didn't think they would consider doing that. Like. Now see, that's hidden. That was hidden and we wouldn't have known unless we just, you know, started clicking random things. But anyways, let me, <laughs> you know what? Yeah, let's just continue from here with, with no hair. We can change the tattoo color. We can change the intensity. Um, looks like these colors are a bit more limited than the other color choices. We can also add piercings. So we got these earrings. Oh, that actually has names for what these are. Stud muffin? <laughs> That's gnarly. We got that. Subdue, subdue loops. 
Midnight Tears, which I guess that's Little Bird Skulls. We have Silver Gold Gala. Dark Moons. Red Skelintha. Cholten Serpents. Crimson Hilt Dirks. Ooh, that's actually... That's kind of tough. Tough looking. Barovia Fangs. Ooh, I like that one. Ooh, I like that one. If I play a Spellcaster, I might do that. Minotaur Ring. We should get the nose. We got Easy Breezy. Pretty basic right there, I would say. Simple. Very pirate-esque. Archface Swirls. Ooh, nope. Commoner Ring. Okay, basic nose. Got Bard Rings. A lot of jingling happening there. And then back to none. This is amazing. Let's look at your eyes. Heterochromia. I forgot. We talked about this too very briefly. You can change both of your eye colors to be whatever you want it to be. You can be as weird, as unique, as specific as you want. Turn that off real quick. And it's just, there are so many options. You can even pull, you can even pull out the special demon eyes that, are, that like aren't native to certain races, like, like flame blue. Look at that. Flame blue too. There is ruby, which I love that color in the eyes, honestly. But you also have, was it just like elf blue, um, white flame. Let's see, flame pink, flame gray, like. This is amazing, and I think they added a few more in here that didn't that didn't used to be there. So, this is awesome. See, makeup looks like it's a lot of the same standard stuff. Um, we just pick one like that. We can change the color to be whatever we want. We have glossy tint level. We have metallic tint level. That's the glossy. We have eye makeup intensity. Then we have lip tint. So let's move you to like a sharper red. Gloss level. Okay, that's glossy. We got metallic tint. Ooh! Kind of like that. Um, we have a lip coloration intensity. Just even, even these little sliders, this extra bit is just nuts. And now, her hair. I was already amazed by the fact that they took gender out of the equation. They took race out of the equation for hair. Every, every hair. Is available, is available for every race, every gender, every, everything is available for hair. And it's awesome. Look at this. This is so cute. I love that. And I forgot, they, they would have added some new ones in here as well that we haven't seen before because not to put hate on the modding community, but Come on, Larian, put the modding community out of work. As developers, they are putting in so much that the modding community won't need to touch. And it's like, I love the modding community for their spirit and what they do, but it's like, a lot of times stuff gets made out of like a necessity. And it's just, there's so much hair that they may not need to make anything in modding for hair. This is just, there's so much here. And it looks so good too. They, they nailed the hair issues from, from early access. The lighting is behaving really well. And it's just, at this point, when you're making your character, if they are not some sort of attractive, then that's an achievement on its own, like, 
everyone, everything just looks so good. This is wild, it really is. Um, so we have hair color selections, not as big as everything else, but it's in here. Now, if I remember correctly, the crutch of this is you pick a base, right? You have highlights you can add to here. You can add, let's try blue. You can add intensity to these highlights. You, they have higher colors, more colors for the highlights. And that, the highlights are playing better with the base color than they used to in early access. This is a great transition. And then we have graying scale. Now this was already here in early access, but it's like, that's stronger than it used to be. And I guess based on the mechanics of this slider, you can change the coloration of the graying. This is amazing. This is so cool. Dang, I wasn't even trying to make someone specific and this just turned out nice. I I like her as is. This is amazing. Like randomize. This scares me. <laughs> this scares me. Like I'm sure that's nice. Like I'm I'm sure some cool stuff can come out of this, but I'm sure some scary stuff can come out of this too. Like Oh god, what's what's that one quote from Star Trek? Endless possibilities and endless diversity or something like that. And it's just this is amazing. Larian did something amazing. Oh my God. <laughs> um, goodness. Okay, so let's grab something a little normal real quick. Um, <laughs> yeah, let, let's go with you. And back into hair. I know there's a spot. Yeah, facial hair. There we go. That's what's looking for. This is also available regardless of gender and body type and all that jazz. Look at this. These are looking pretty good. Hell, even the thumbnail for these looks really nice. And honestly, they match or they're, they're connected. It's good. We can add individual graying across both. Okay. I'm sure there's probably some funky combinations you can do between facial hair and then and then this hair. Highlights. Will that be honored throughout the beard? No. Graying. Look at that. So it kind of trickles into it. So there's more it's stronger up here, but it's lighter down here. So if you go back into facial and you do graying, you have the slider for the whole thing. This is amazing. I never noticed this. I never noticed this over here for the randomize button. It it keeps it. Everything you randomize, it saves it so that you can get it back. That's that's innovation right there. That tiny bit, that's innovation. But it looks like it, it only saved the randomizer. It didn't save what I had before the randomizer. But still, this is. Mwah, chef hands, this is great. Oh my goodness, this is. Ah. All right, everyone, that is it for this mega character creation video. We are approaching over two hours and 13 ish minutes. If you are crazy enough to have made it to the end of this video, I applaud you. I really do. And if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel, um, view the other content and just 
hype yourself up, have fun, just jump into this game and get lost because we're going to be here for quite a long time. And don't forget, if you like this shirt, I have other shirts and even hats um, for the classes on the link down below for my webs for my um, shop. So if you want one, go grab it for yourself down there. And until next time, y'all stay safe out there. This is going to be a fun game and I can't wait to show y'all more.